Hello, friends, friends from India and friends from out of the country and uh, friends from the United Kingdom. A very good evening to all of you and good morning to countries who have been watching us out of our time zone. IIGS takes pride and privilege in hosting the IIGS Prime Time, which showcases the best of the talents across the globe on various subspecialties. IIGS strives hard for promoting the minimal invasive surgery academics on various modes, of which the IIGS Prime Time is one of the very important modes in showcasing the people who have spent their lifetime and career on gaining special experience on single zone. Today, we have our national president, a Professor L.P. Thangavelu, sir, amidst us to welcome all of you. Can we have the honor of listening to our president, Dr. L.P. Thangavelu, sir? Good evening, friends. Uh, uh, I am uh, uh, L.P. Thangavelu, president of IAGS. Uh, uh, greetings from India, IAGS. And uh, 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 Professor Tom, Professor John Aron and my good friend uh, Selva and Kanagavil. Uh, our moderator, moderator has not joined uh, Kanagavil. Not joined. Uh, I'm really honored and happy to be here to participate in this uh, prime time to welcome you all for this excellent program. IAGS is, uh, you all know, it's a very premier association in India, uh, propagating minimal access surgery with a membership of more than uh, 10,000 life members. And we are involving ourselves in IAGS, involving ourselves in a lot of academic activities. Our main objective is academic activity. The other, uh, apart from academic activities, we have uh, we are having a lot of social responsibilities also. We involve ourselves in uh, many social activities like during uh, COVID time. We have set up a COVID task force and we have helped many people, many institutions, many practitioners, wherever uh, help is needed, IAGS uh, went there and helped out and um, uh, during uh, flood times in Chennai, we IAGS uh, contributed on so, and, and not only in Chennai, many areas, we IAGS involved ourselves, all our members took active part in helping uh, people in and around the affected areas. Our uh, academic activities, you know, we are connecting many CME programs. And our prestigious uh, 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 programs is uh, fellowship programs. We are training uh, young surgeons for in basic laparoscopic surgery and awarding fellowships. And it's a well-structured, well-planned program. And uh, 40 modules of lecture session, live surgery, endotrainer, so on. And almost all the eminent faculties in India are participating in all our fellowship programs and training the, they took, I mean, they are enthusiastic in training the uh, young surgeons. So, and we are uh, awarding uh, FIAGS uh, fellowship programs. And in advanced surgery also we have got, uh, we are training uh, uh, people, surgeons after basic surgery. Uh, Sir, welcome, sir. Uh, Prasanna, welcome. Um, we are training a lot of our youngsters and uh, uh, young surgeons in advanced laparoscopic surgery also. The endoscopy, which has been, which has slipped out of uh, surgeon science in India, uh, that we are, uh, surgeons are taking, we, IAGS members are taking uh, serious efforts in bringing back endoscopy to surgeon's hands um, and we are conducting and uh, several skill courses in uh, uh, basic, uh, I mean, uh, surgeries like cholecystectomy and hernia. We are conducting several uh, programs uh, to, to give tips and uh, how to manage the problems 
how how to do the surgery step by step what are the complications if the complications uh, occur what are the bailout options and how to manage the complications all these details we are uh, and we have trained more than uh, 4000 uh, uh, surgeons in basic fellowship surgery and we have uh, trained nearly 1200 uh, uh, young surgeons in advanced surgery also apart from that we are involving encouraging lot of uh, research activities we are uh, 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 creating the several awards for research activities for the postgraduate thesis we are we have created five lakhs uh, every year for five postgraduates to encourage them to come out with a good thesis in national congresses uh, you know we have created for best video presentation and uh, for best paper presentation uh, we have created five lakhs each in each area and uh, we are uh, giving uh, these awards to postgraduates to encourage them in academic and we have created traveling fellowship for 10 young surgeons each one lakh they can go and have training at any recognized center in india or abroad or under a recognized professor and best paper presentation in jmas for that also we are giving uh, awards for five persons and best research papers we are giving awards for five persons each carry one lakh the totally five lakhs and uh, we are having international collaboration with other organizations als gba and uh, ipsis elsa and uh, sark countries and we are conducting periodic online programs and we are inviting them uh, uh, as faculty to our uh, uh, conference national conferences midterm conferences and uh, regional conferences Similarly, they invite us as faculty to their uh, 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 conferences. With this uh, few words, I welcome you all to the National Congress, which is going to be organized in a very grand manner uh, at Kwayamuthu, south southern part of India, uh, in February 9, 10, 11, 2023. Uh, with this, Few words. Uh, I welcome my good friend uh, Prasanna Kumar Reddy. Um, uh, uh, thanks for your uh, presence here, uh, Prasanna. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of inviting and introducing the moderator for this evening, Professor P. K. Prasanna Kumar Reddy an eminent minimally invasive surgeon and the lead surgeon and the director of minimally invasive surgery from Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. Ladies and gentlemen, I also have to have the habit of uh, introducing a pleasant gentleman, Dr. Chalaya Selvasekar, who has been instrumental in creating this model of the program. And I also warmly welcome the trainee surgeon, uh, um, uh, we are going to have a unique experience of listening to a young surgeon about the way we are having the program and to take our comments and interact with the senior professors here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we warmly welcome Professor P.K. Reddy, sir, to introduce the first speaker and moderate the session, please. At the outset, I'm very much thankful to IAGS and President Dr. Professor L.P. Tangavelu and Professor Dr. Kanagavelu, who is the brainchild of this. Um, um, prime video programs and I'm, I'm thankful to both of them for inviting me to participate in this it is it is a pleasure and honor for me to introduce a young surgeon like like mr tan arampalam arampalam is is i would say that when when i when i graduate when i graduated Ms. arampalam has joined the medical school and uh, and he's I mean uh, I, I when I went through his his bio data I I'm really very much impressed actually he graduated from one of the most famous medical schools Saint Bart's Medical School where I had a brief stint of uh, privilege of working there for a short period 
And having graduated from St. Bart's Medical School, and he worked in the University of London and did and had got his MD from the University of London. And subsequently, he got his doctorate also. And uh, the, one of the most interesting things what I noticed in, the, in his CV is that he's always a, a very, very vibrant person with not only ex expert skills, but also an excellent teacher and always would like to help others to train and teach and train and do the research. These three things are very much embedded in, in, in Professor Tang Alampala. And, and Professor Alampala, he's, he's worked in Rome with a famous professor. And uh, from there, he got his laparoscopic skills and came back and he was appointed as the senior consultant and uh, at the um, Colchester hospitals. And um, I'm, I'm, it really is my privilege to, to introduce him, to give a talk on the, to give a talk on the surgeons and their burnt out in this, in this program. It, just a few few words to say. Surgeons are always burnt out. If they are not burnt out, they are not happy. But how much, what degree of burnt out they can take and how it can be manipulated to such a way that they will help the, not only the patients and the society, that's a, one of the important things to say. And another thing which I noticed about uh, Professor Arlampalam, there is a very nice thing I call the, he is beating the bow cancer. He is one of the leaders of that and in the campaign for the beating the bowel cancer. And um, Professor Arlampalam, it is my privilege to invite you to give a talk on the subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Reddy. And uh, uh, Professor Tangavelu uh, and uh, Dr. Kanagavale and uh, all of the committee of IAGES. Uh, I hope I can uh, live up to uh, the introduction you have given me. Uh, they're very kind words, but uh, obviously we all work as a team. So uh, I'm going to now share my screen. And for the next 20 to 25 minutes, I will uh, talk to you about my experience and my uh, uh, um, thoughts on burnout and performance, how we can innovate to uh, make surgery better for our patients and ourselves. I have some disclosures. Uh, none of these uh, relate to this talk. So disease is very old. Um, and, you know, what we are able to um, do in terms of our technical skills um, can be quite limited. Having the maximum technical skills and proficiency does not necessarily lead to uh, you uh, being the best surgeon in the block. And why is that? Why can we not always get these um, technical proficiencies to translate into great outcomes? pure safety, uh, lack of complications, and low mortality. So the journey today will be really to look at what did the old world look at look like before the pandemic? I think it's important to understand what burnout is. Uh, uh, Professor Reddy talked about all surgeons are burnt out. Uh, I think that just re really reflects that we're ordinary people doing extraordinary jobs. We are ordinary people doing extraordinary jobs. And actually, if we don't have some sense of uh, a feel uh, for, for how we're performing, then we don't do ourselves or our patients any justice. I'm going to touch on the team and also look at system thinking. So this is a wide, wide topic about how we get our best outcomes. But what I'm going to focus on is performance and how you bring your best self to work, because there are going to be some excellent talks on on technical matters. And what I'd like to do is uh, get, give you a flavor of how you can translate that 
into excellence in the real world. So we'll look at the evolution uh, of the evidence, the reversibility and awareness of burnout, where to target interventions, uh, looking at the concept of psychological safety, uh, and also uh, the impact of surgical teams and sy system thinking. So what are the problems? Well, the problems are that there are high rates of complication. There's relentless economic and media pressure on, on our outcomes. There's a focus on safety, quality, and transparency that we sometimes feel gets in the way of us delivering our training. There's regulation. There are high rates of burnout and depression and early retirement. We're particularly seeing this after the pandemic. Uh, and, and you can read uh, the, the whole list that I've got on the screen. Uh, this makes it very difficult for us to conduct our normal day-to-day -day work and to deliver the service to our patients. And, and really the background is that there has been a global financial meltdown. Uh, we have the, the, the financial crisis of 2008, and, and we haven't really recovered. And there's constant political intervention in healthcare, um, varying from the regulation of the private sector to uh, the, the uh, expansion of public health systems, which are very costly. And of course, all the time we have aging and uh, uh, um, uh, larger populations. We don't quite understand data and technology. If you look at the digital health and digital hygiene of a, and the average doctor, they don't really uh, understand those concepts of cybersecurity. And all the time our workforce is, uh, is diminishing and our planetary health and human health are so, so tightly connected. We have to understand how we are going to be sustainable as we go forward. And I, I think that sustainability is about our workforce, our surgeons. So um, there are several factors uh, that, that come to mind. There is the efficiency targets and then there are outcome measures. And increasingly, we will be measured by our patient reported outcomes as well as our clinician reported outcomes. Uh, but we must, we must remember that we are the guardians of quality. So when we have uh, politically driven efficiency targets, regulation and cost control, um, we must remember that we're primarily here to serve our patients. And the pandemic has changed everything. Surgeons were not the primary important uh, clinician. Uh, normally, if there's an earthquake or a disaster, a bomb, surgeons are essential. But we weren't the essential uh, part of the medical workforce. We were redeployed. It caused anxiety. We had significant disruption to our workload. And what did that result in? That resulted in a huge backlog of surgery, millions of operations not being conducted, and millions of operations for our trainees uh, not to be part of. So training is in crisis. And all the time, we have had moral injuries where we've uh, witnessed or taken part in things that transgress our, our normal moral compass. So uh, I mentioned this already, but this is a real problem, the aging pro population, the silver tsunami. And all, of course, we have the problem of diabetes, whether it's uh, 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 endocrine uh, issues, whether it's cancer, uh, we have uh, uh, an impact that we're going to see. And all the time, this is impacting on patient safety. So 14 out of every 100 patients are affected by a hospital-acquired infection. One in 10 patients are harmed in hospital. The statistics are staggering, and we can do better. It's not about just technical proficiency. We have to have the whole package because we know that 15% of hospital costs are due to patient harm caused by adverse events. So we can actually be part of a virtuous circle to try and make the situation better, and it is our responsibility to do so. Uh, and, and I've put some slides showing that, you know, even if you think you're the best surgeon in the world, we have to have some vulnerability in, in and, and acceptance that our services do have complications, do have increased rates of avoidable uh, complications and deaths. And, and Atul Gawande was, was very prescient when he actually said surgery itself is a disease. This is a very good paper um, looking at global health. So we have a problem. Uh, what are the root causes of these problems? And they seem to be all centered around human factors. So these are the factors that make us not machines, not entirely predictable uh, beings, uh, failures of leadership and failures of communication. 
And so maintaining surgical surgeon wellness, so the sustainability of the surgeon is really important. And, and I'd like to just demonstrate this by showing you the four real waves of the pandemic. The first wave that we witnessed was the health crisis. That was back in March 2020, when we had a pathogen that we really did not understand, and there were people dying inexplic inexplicably. Uh, and although that that rate may be 0.5 to 1%, um, you know, it, it was it was huge, and we were worried about our health services being overwhelmed. We then had the second wave, which was the real impact on our resources and the restriction on urgent care. And that caused us uh, problems over the course of 2021 when we had subsequent waves of different types of, of COVID. And then the third wave is what we are starting to have to deal with now. We're dealing with supply chain issues. We're dealing with um, uh, the backlog of surgery um, that has to be tackled. And of course, we're all seeing diseases, whether we're cancer surgeons, whether we're obesity surgeons, we are seeing people at later stages of disease. Which, which is which altogether different in the way we can approach them. But all the while, there's been a fourth wave of psychic trauma to our medical workforce, our clinicians and our nurses. There's been a huge uh, amount of burnout, there's economic injury and mental illness that, that we as doctors aren't the best at acknowledging and we as surgeons are probably the poorest. So I'm going to just talk about burnout because this is a real issue. It doesn't matter whether you're in India, whether you're in the US, whether you're in the United Kingdom or Europe. This is a, a real phenomenon characterized by depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and a sense of reduced personal accomplishment. And, and there are personal and professional sequelae. It affects relationships, there are financial issues, you may end up with substance abuse, the, the rate of alcohol consumption over the pandemic and the general population has increased. And this has been reflected in our medical workforce as well. And of course, the rate of suicide is enormous. If you are reported to your regulatory body, for example, in the UK, it's the, uh, the GMC, the General Medical Council, the rate of suicide for those doctors is enormous. But there's a professional um, problem, disengagement, um, problems with performance, uh, high staff turnover, and perhaps patient safety incidents. But we can talk about that because perhaps people who are burnt out may be more likely to report patient uh, uh, safety incidents. And, and Shanafelt wrote uh, a, a very good uh, summary of this. You know, 54% of doctors are emotionally exhausted. You know, what, what are doctors? Um, Patients come to see us because they're in pain or have fear. And when they see us, they transfer that to, to us. We carry that around in our hearts, in our heads constantly. And as a surgeon, you not only carry that, but you also have this terrifying uh, trust that is given to us to perform surgical operations, to actually incise into a patient. And, and that causes a lot of uh, stress uh, and anguish. 40% uh, of the NHS consultants are burnt out, and in surgeons, the, the figure may be 40 to 75%. 27.8% um, of surgeons score very highly in the depersonalization at work, and that's second only to uh, pathology and microbiology. And many, many surveys show that burnt out doctor is twice as likely to be involved in a patient safety incidence. Uh, and, and my group uh, published on uh, factors associated with burnout. Um, and we found that there were some uh, personal issues, family income, uh, lack of extracurricular activities. There were some psychological factors in the doctor themselves. Did they have the emotional grit? It's very interesting uh, just hearing uh, uh, Professor Reddy's introduction. Of course, we need to be at the edge, we're the sharp end of the spear, but we also need to protect ourselves. So, so, so personality-wise, we need that grit. And of course, there's the work setting, academic versus service hospitals, how error is dealt with, 
what the workload is for, for, for surgeons. If it's more than 60 hours of work a week continuously, those are bullets that are being fired every day. And then we have to look at the work environment, job satisfaction, aggressive patients, lack of administrative support, lack of autonomy uh, when we're working, and lack of mentoring. There's several studies showing that if you have a surgeon, if you have a clinician, and you actually uh, want them to do stuff, the way you should you should tailor their workload is actually to look at giving them um, 20% of the time where they do something that they feel is meaningful because meaningful work is why we all get up in the morning. Um, and the, the other 80% so, um, a clinician will do whatever you ask of them, but it's important to give them that time to be autonomous. And, and we know that there are problems because there's, um, there's inten increased intensity and complexity of workload, organizational antipathy, problems with interpersonal relationships. We all know that when we go into hospital, there's a lot of rivalry, there can be problems when uh, there's private practice involved. And of course, people have problems with their personal life. And of course, there are several myths in how you deal with this. There's the perfection myth that if people try hard enough, they'll not make any errors. And, and that's an absolute nonsense, we know. There's the punishment myth. If we punish people uh, when they make errors, they will make fewer errors. And we know that that isn't true either. And I, I, I love this, this uh, quote from René LaRiche in the beginning of Henry Marsh's book, uh, Do No Harm. Every surgeon carries within himself or herself a small cemetery where from time to time he or she goes to pray, a place of bitterness and regret where he must look for an explanation for his failures. And, and that's, that's what many of us carry around uh, with us all the time. Um, so surgeons are vulnerable because of their commitment and self-sacrifice and perfectionism. Um, the other groups that are high risk are GPs, psychiatrists, but also we must look after our trainees. We must, must, must spend time. And, and recent surveys have shown that speciality wise, the emergency services, um, urology, general surgery, they're all very high in the burnout index. So there was a study looking at vascular surgical trainees. What were the... Um, uh, factors that affected them. It was depression, stress, uh, the fact that there was no formal mentoring, a violation of the 80-hour work, 80 work week, no organized social program and low levels of social support. These are all problems. And how do we spot the burnt out surgeon? We can spot them because they're emotionally drained, fatigued and frustrated, feeling unable to accomplish too much, not enjoying their work with patients. All of these um, things are important to acknowledge. Um, so what should we do? Well, the immediate thing is to stop, seek professional help, speak to your colleagues and formulate a plan. It is really, really, really important. There are several resources in our country, such as the uh, local signposting, NHS practitioner help. Um, there's a doctor support network and the Royal Colleges are, are very good now at acknowledging that this is a real problem. Um, I think it's important that the principles that we follow are system, organization, and individual. And I, I really like to stress when, when we talk about burnout, this is not the fault of the individual. This is more often a system-wide problem that we ought to be addressing. Um, so we can undo the damage. There are very, very basic principles, and, and that is all about empowerment and looking at how organizations deal with these problems and understanding that these problems start at medical school because we, we accept in medical school the highest performers of our school leavers, but we then put them into a culture where there's excessive management and focus on budget with complex financial incentives. We really need to focus on quality, protect our civility and reject greed. That's what will make us strong. And this brings me to the concept of psychological safety and empowerment. So there's been a lot written about this and we are really starting to understand that having psychological safety in, in the environment and delivery of our medical practice is really important. And it can be likened to a very, very fragile vase, which we put on a table. And the table represents behaviours. These are kindness, empathy, civility and assertiveness. They're really, really important things. But the table has to be supported by attitudes. And those attitudes are respect, humility curiosity and trust 
And I would say to you, if you stop and think about your current workplace, do these attitudes and behaviours, are they pervasive and part of the culture? We know that there are many high reliability organisations that we could learn about in terms of changing organisational cultures, looking at outcomes, looking at the process of optimization and support. But we know that no system is foolproof for a sufficiently inventive fool. And the team is very important. And this is where the human factors come in. Um, we have the vulnerable individual. So we need to learn team skills and team resource management. In the airline industry, this is called crew resource management. So if you, if you all stop now and think about a team that you've been working in, what makes a good team? What were the enablers? What were the inhibitory factors? What were the behaviors that, that uh, characterize both of these? So we can talk about enabling respect, autonomy, having plans, fairness, clear roles. But the inhibitory factors we see in our workplaces every single day, the domineering character, bullying, fear, being unkind, the mood hoover who sucks up the joy of being at work, uh, chaos in, in terms of planning. So it's really important. And I, I also think we need to think about what a team is. And I would say a good definition, sorry, we'll go backwards, is a group of people working cooper cooperatively towards a shared goal. How many of us reiterate that? And there are, there are characteristics um, and team skills that NASA and the University of Texas studied. These are briefing, communication and decision making, team self-feedback, inquiry and advocacy, leadership and followership, which is really important, interpersonal relationships and group climate, preparation and planning, workload and distractions. Those are all eight key factors that the University of Texas with NASA found. But there's one that is the gatekeeper to all the others. Have a think what you think it is. It is. And I would say to you, it's interpersonal relationships and group climate. So the key message is high performing teams allow the surgeon to, to uh, deliver their full potential. So there's an, an employer's role in this. Doing Schwartz rounds is important. Uh, I'm not going to spend, some uh, spend time on this. We know that resilience is important, but a surgeon can't be told to just get resilient. There has to be an environment that helps this grow. I just want to finish up by just talking about the story of Charles Plum. He was a, a, a fighter pilot for the US Navy. Uh, he flew from the US Kitty Hawk and he was shot down over Korea. And, and when he was shot down, he uh, was put in a prison for six years, tortured. Eventually he got out and he was on the speaker circuit in the United States. And in the US, he was sitting at a dinner table with his um, wife many years afterwards. And, uh, and the person at the next table, uh, this is an apocryphal story, said, uh, you're, you're Charles Plum, aren't you? And uh, he, he was really surprised, taken aback. He said, how does this man know me? And he said, how do you know me? And he said, well, um, you flew off the USS Kitty Hawk. You were shot down and your life was saved. I was the guy who packed your parachute. So we need to know who around us is there to protect us. And I would say to you, in terms of bringing your best self to work, your four parachutes are your physical wellness, your mental wellness, your emotional wellness, and your spiritual wellness. Your spiritual wellness is why you get up in the morning to do such a demanding job and enjoy it. Um, so it's all about personal recognition of, and self-care and awareness, that psychological awareness, making sure you stay healthy so you bring your best self to work. And I'm not going to go into detail. We can discuss this if you wish. But basically, um, in terms of burnout, we know that if you're going to deliver great HIPEC service, great colorectal cancer service, great bariatric service, you have to have a well surgeon. You have to have somebody who understands the tenets of leadership and you have to have great role models. And that has to be sustained over a 30 year career. So the evidence base for burnout is growing. We know it's reversible. We're building awareness. We know where to target interventions. And we, we are finally understanding what psychological safety is. We know that the system is very important in all of this. And we can, we can talk all day about that system. But we also know that the team is very important. So thank you very much for your time. I, I will just leave you with the thought that it's okay 
to be not okay. <clears throat> Professor Tan, I mean, wonderfully put it, and, and I really enjoyed the talk. And what is, what is the important message you have given is exactly what every surgeon faces. And as you mentioned very clearly, there are so many factors around the surgeons, but one of the important things you stressed on is interpersonal relationships and then also leadership skills and then forming a team. This is, these are one of the, some of the important things. And other things, you beautifully showed the, the four legs of a table, but each one is important. If you miss one, the table will fall and the, and the glass walls will break. So I, I really appreciate and uh, excellent talk. I, thank you very much. It's very nice of you. And, and thank you for the honor. It's, uh, it's really, um, really good. And I'm so glad that Liana has joined us because uh, this is something that we uh, old guys uh, and uh, ladies need to realize that, that there is a whole uh, train of amazingly talented people coming up uh, behind us and we need to um, really nurture them and ensure that they grow in the right way. Oh, very true, very true. Um, I, just, I just also wanted to ask a question um, in, in this topic. I think, so, so we, there has been a lot of discussion lately about the factors that um, affect burnout and you talked a lot about leadership and um, resilience and um, teamwork, but but what do you think is what what stops uh, what, what stops people from essentially stop getting burned out? Because it, it seems that we are aware that it is happening, but what do you think stops us from essentially stopping it eventually? Um, I, I think it's really important that you one understands that we are uh, biological beings that were um, we're meant to work at a level of stress that's what our physiology ha has designed it's when that stress is not acknowledged and controlled and when we don't have a, a decent output for it so so when you say how to prevent burnout i love my work uh, dr dr professor reddy said you know surgeons lo love being being, being busy. There are three things you need to have a happy surgeon. You need a nice place for them to live. They need to be well remunerated, but most important, they want volume. So sometimes we're our own worst enemy. So in, in answer to your question, I think, I think it's looking at those four factors. Being physically fit and healthy is really important. Um, and giving yourself time. 69% of surgeons operate in pain. And don't be fooled by robotics because the pain will just transfer to the small muscles of your hand and wrist and, and neck rather than your back and shoulders. So, so pain is, emo, uh, being uh, physically fit is important. We need to be mentally fit. So that's your cognitive processes. Are you thinking straight? Decisions are more important than incisions. And then you need to be emotionally uh, on the right playing field. And, and to be emotionally on the right playing field, that's your social support. Um, who are your loved ones? Who, who, who are your friends? Who, who are, who's looking after you? And then your spiritual uh, health is really important. Why do you get up to go to work? Are you still curious to help people? So if you're checking in with yourself on those four fronts and you're getting support, then I think the likelihood of burnout is, is much less. You know, we, we work in very stressful situations and we get through. Uh, so I'm not one of those people saying we mustn't do these things. These are, uh, we've got a job of work and a vocation that we have to deliver. We have to find a way of doing that. And I think one of the ways is to acknowledge that we have to address certain issues to make ourselves turn up to work in the best possible shape. Thank you. And, and, and by the way, the minimum level that I'm uh, uh, assuming is that you have the knowledge. So the, the things that Jonathan's going to talk about, the things that, that are part of this amazing series is, is, a, is a given. So we are, we are diligent, conscientious learners, but we have to do the other bits as well. 
So Leona's question is a very interesting question. See, if you analyze it, every surgeon has got a degree of stress and it is not comparable to each other. So you what, the, what I feel is, with all my experience, you should not exceed that degree. If you exceed that degree, as you mentioned quite clearly, the, the burn, burnout starts. So to keep it under control, that is, that's where the, the surgeon must realize what, at when to stop and how to stop, how to ask for help. That's the way we have to learn from that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Tan, uh, we've been uh, enjoying your talk much and a uh, lot of other facts have come in and you have given serious thoughts about uh, even a micro issue which have been, we have been facing or we have been accepting as a standard of care in our practice. I have a quick question. Uh, many systems, the Australian systems, the Swedish systems, have someone like a mentor at every level. Even the consultants have their mentor to share if something is not okay with them or if they feel many times the confidentiality is almost 100% because it is like open sharing. Yes, I am not able to accept this as a problem or I am not able to accept this happening before my eyes. But many times we keep quiet for various reasons, for administrative reasons or academic reasons. So how is the NHS taking this issue up? Like, do we have a hierarchical reporting system or do we have a hierarchical remedial system? And what is the role of uh, or how NHS or how serious is NHS on this issue? So, so uh, it's a very good question. My my answer will be take take a long time to give you. But in short, uh, I think the NHS is trying but doing very poorly. I think um, there are various uh, initiatives uh, at. Um, college levels and association levels to try and start mentoring programs and coaching programs. But, um, you know, if you take a snapshot of trainees, we're in utter crisis and they are not getting the support that they need. And they don't need lots of operations. What they need is they need that Saturday morning ward round when you, when you went round with your senior consultant and they told you the things that you don't hear or you don't read in the books, how to sustain your practice, how to deal with the difficult patient, uh, how to deal with the complication that really uh, it, it is, it is dreadful because when we do things that are wrong, uh, that go wrong, that they, they affect us. We, you know, there's always a second victim. So, so coaching and mentorship is very important. And when many people say that this happens, you know, that they're, they're mentor to X, Y, and Z, but mentorship requires skill. It needs to be structured. And organizations like IAGES are perfectly placed to start this sort of program. I personally have a coach who I talk to every month about um, how I'm performing. Um, I talk about complications um, and, and look at where I'm going. Uh, and, and of course, all of us as surgeons have three phases to our career, uh, the climbing the mountain, uh, the cruising, and then at some point, we have to stop being surgeons. Uh, I think, you know, that that stage up to retirement is very important. But all the while, we're role models for our juniors. So so Liana may be able to, to add to the answer to that question, but I, I don't think it's done very well. And the NHS is losing people because it's not using the knowledge from these very, very, very experienced people who uh, are fed up or, or uh, unhappy with the way uh, they're being treated. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. The NHS actually has, has lots of very good things uh, structurally that it could put out. But I have to say the colleges are trying really hard, as are the associations as our trainee groups, because they've realized that if, if it's not coming from above, they've got to build it themselves. And sometimes building new structures is, is a good way 
of of moving forward thank you very much uh, that sounds a lot of efforts are happening and i'm happy you have a good coach like many times uh, when we have bad results, uh, when we are uncertain about, especially the re-entries, short early re-entries, not happens very often, but then those are the gray areas where we cannot look upon guidelines or when we cannot look upon our own impulsive decisions also. So those are the areas which we still feel sort of little uncertain. And uh, as you grow more senior, you end up delaying the decision. That's my personal feel. Because you know that by doing, if you're not positive about getting a result, then you end up delaying. But it's very nice to have a right coach, which who always is the fallback option when in difficult situation. I only trust this type of fallback requirement is much less in our career. But it's always nice to hear that. I'm sure uh, NHS is doing a great job. And uh, I, I'm i sure uh, under the leadership of our president, IGS also will have initiatives. Let us try and do a collaborative model. Let us understand how the NHS does it. And I'm sure IHS can have an initiative on that in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, ready, sir. Uh, President, sir, can we move on to the next talk? Please. You. Uh, can I have the honor of inviting uh, Professor Jonathan Weil? Can we have your presentation, sir? Certainly, I'll, uh, I'll share my screen now. Just you a see bit of an introduction. Um, uh, Professor Wild um, is a, a consultant colorectal surgeon uh, based in the uh -huh. city in Manchester. Uh, he trained in Sheffield and he has done a fellowship uh, looking at uh, the peritoneal uh, surgery at in Ireland. And he's also done advanced colorectal surgery fellowship with uh, Professor Pete Sagar in Leeds. So he's an experienced uh, surgeon and he's interested in surgical education. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for giving a presentation today. Perfect introduction, Selva. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Sagar. And uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, many thanks to the Indian Association of Gastrointestinal and Endosurgeons for uh, the invitation and the privilege of speaking to you this evening. I don't have any conflicts of interest. So I'm, uh, as Sekar says, I'm a surgeon at the Christie Hospital in Manchester, which is the largest single site comprehensive cancer centre in Europe. Uh, it's the first of its kind in the UK. Um, and at the Christie, we treat um, over 60,000 oncology patients per year, uh, around about, uh, that covers the population, the three and a half million population of Greater Manchester, but about a quarter of our patients come from the rest of the UK and further afield. In terms of the colorectal and peritoneal oncology centre, or CPOC, uh, we've been a UK nationally commissioned centre for cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC since 2002, so we're approaching our 20-year anniversary. Um, and over that 20 years, we've performed over 1,500 cytoritis surgery and hyper procedures uh, today. Uh, around 100 of the, over 100 of those uh, performed uh, uh, minimally invasively. Um, we perform about 200 cytoritis procedures uh, with hyper a year. Uh, we also do other things. So we're a, uh, a group of nine uh, colorectal surgeons. Uh, we're also a uh, referral center regionally for pelvic exenterative surgery. Uh, we're a specialist uh, a regional sarco uh, sarcoma service. Uh, we're also a European center of excellence for new endocrine tumors and the, uh, the largest anal, we have the largest anal cancer MDT in Europe. So in terms of context to this talk, um, which is about uh, laparoscopic or minimally invasive cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC, um, uh, for context, um, uh, saturated surgeon HIPEC is uh, an effective treatment for uh, a, a variety of peritoneal surface malignancies, including peritoneal metastases arising from the appendix, the, the low grade um, pen, mucinous appendiceal neoplasms, the LAMs, um, which give rise to uh, pseudomexoma peritone or PMP, and also the invasive, more invasive um, appendix uh, pathologies, the appendix adenocarcinoma and goblet cell adenocarcinoma, the appendix. Uh, but it's also, cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC is also indicated for 
peritoneal metastases arising from colorectal ovarian primaries, gastric primaries, also for um, uh, malignant mesothelioma and benign multicystic uh, mesothelioma. So again, some more context in terms of um, uh, what is cytoreductive surgery in HIPAC? Well, there's two components. There's the cytoreductive surgery, which is removal of all the macroscopic peritoneal disease. And then that's followed by combining the cytoreductive surgery with um, HIPEC or hypothermic intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy, which targets any potential residual microscopic disease. In terms of how we quantify peritoneal disease burden and distribution, we have Paul Sugar Baker's well-established peritoneal carcinomatosis index or PCI, where we divide each of, we divide the abdominal pelvic regions into 13, uh, giving each a score zero to three, depending on the size of the uh, largest lesion. Um, so the highest, uh, the higher the PCI, uh, the worse prognosis. And then we have the standardized assessment of completeness of cytoreduction, the completeness of cytoreduction score or CC score, uh, where all diseases removed gives a CC score of zero. If there's uh, peritoneal uh, implants uh, remaining, they're unable to be resected, uh, there's a diameter of, uh, of 2.5 uh, millimeters, then um, or less that gives us a score of CC1. Um, if there's any residual disease greater than a uh, quarter of a centimetre, uh, then it's a score of two or, or three. Um, a, a score of zero or one is defined as a uh, adequate or complete size reduction. Um, a one, because the HIPEC, when combined with HIPEC, the HIPEC can penetrate tissues up to four millimetres. So if there's a 2.5 millimetre nodule, then uh, we have to assume that the HIPEC um, uh, treats that successfully, hence a complete size reduction. So in terms of, uh, for, this is open cytoreductive surgery survival. This is our data at the Christie. Um, you'll see that the blue lines in these survival curves are uh, with pa pa for patients who've uh, had a complete cytoreduction, so a CC01. Um, the red line is unfortunately patients that uh, were, una we were unable to achieve a complete cytoreduction, so a CC203. Um, and you, you'll notice a clear survival benefit patients who, in whom you achieve a complete cytoreduction. So if we're looking at the, this survival curve, uh, which looks at the patient group with uh, PMP or low-grade dependency mucous neoplasms, uh, the overall survival uh, is over 95% of five years. On to um, the more invasive appendix pathologies then. Still, when patients have a complete cytoreduction, we get good outcomes with 70% alive at five years. Um, the survival isn't as good for colorectal peritoneal metastases due to the nature of the, the beast, but um, uh, in those patients who have a complete cytoreduction, about 40% are alive at five years. Median survival um, in this group of patients is um, uh, around 44 months, which uh, is uh, much more effective than uh, the alternative, which is systemic cancer, cancer therapy. However, um, open cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC is associated with significant risk of major morbidity, long length of stay. Contemporary reviews of morbidity and mortality uh, following open cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC demonstrate a, uh, a significant risk of high grade morbidity of between 10 to 34%. Um, and 30-day uh, mortality of uh, between 0.8 to, to 4%. So that's more contemporary uh, data published. Going back a decade or two before, then the rates of high-grade high mor morbidity and mortality were, were much greater, uh, but things have certainly improved over the last decade. And, 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 and that morbidity and mortality compares well to um, uh, other major intradermal resections. Um, but uh, our, our data at the Christie uh, again, compares extremely well with um, with the published data. But when it comes to open cytoreductive surgery, it's it's the maximally invasive approach. It's the long midline incision from the ziphystern and right the way right down to the, the the pubic bone, which certainly is the major contributor to uh, morbidity in these patients. So, um, can the benefits of uh, laparoscopy be transferred to cytoreductive surgery in HIPAC? And vice versa, are the oncological benefits that I've showed in the survival curves, uh, 
uh, are they achievable with a laparoscopic approach? Well, in terms of laparoscopic saturated surgery hyper, um, in terms of any both open approach as well, careful patient selection is critical, and and certainly more so with uh, if you if you're considering a a minimally invasive approach. You see the CT scan of a patient with high volume PMP, the calcified uh, appendix uh, tumor with large volume of mucin societies, um, and this patient with locally advanced um, uh, colorectal adenocarcinoma with peritoneal disease. You see a chronic stent there. This approach isn't isn't um, something you could you could attempt with um, the laparoscope. Um, it needs maximally invasive surgery. Whereas in in other uh, this other uh, patient scans below. Um, where um, the, these patients with localized, small volume, often um, unicompartment disease, um, localized stable disease, which lesions are accessible with a laparoscope, then a minimally invasive uh, approach could be considered. And uh, certainly, there's, a, there's there's great potential benefits for for, for patients um, potentially to be achieved with a, a minimally invasive approach. Um, it's obviously less invasive, reduced length of stay, as we know. Uh, early return to bowel function, uh, reduced time to uh, uh, recover and uh, and uh, earlier to, uh, norm, to to resume normal activities and obviously a better cosmetic outcome. Um, but there are uh, major concerns over a laparoscopic approach. Um, you know, through the laparoscope, you need a really care, well, for cytorid surgery, initially you need a really careful and thorough assessment of peritoneal cavity. Um, and through the laparoscopic, as we know, it's difficult to to visualize those hard to reach places, yeah, high up um, uh, below the diaphragmatic surfaces, um, down deep down in the pelvis, lesser lesser sac, especially in patients with a high body mass index or patients that have had uh, previous surgery with adhesions. Um, when performing uh, laparoscopic cytoreductive surgery, um, you require to change the patient on the, t on the operating table in multiple positions. You need to be able to operate in multi-abdominal compartments. Um, you need at least two um, screens um, in, in your theatres, at least two, um, and certainly a fully integrated uh, laparoscopic theatre is, is, is beneficial. A 30-degree scope is required. Uh, as is a high-pec uh, perfusion machine um, uh, where that, it, that is capable of delivering high-pec with a closed abdominal technique. And uh, above all else, a lot of patients is required, patience is required for this type of surgery. But um, certainly loss of tactile feedback is an issue. You lose the ability to, um, to detect potential very occult small peritoneal implants, especially those along the um, mesentery border of the small bowel that you often find at cytoreductive surgery by running the small bowel. You don't see it, but you, you feel it. And the concern is with the minimally invasive approach, then these lesions can be missed. So you're heavily reliant on good quality cross-sectional imaging. And, and even in, even in high-quality CT scans, um, often it will miss small nodules less than 0.5 um, centimeters. Um, so there is an overall concern, and it's a similar concern when it comes to resections for locally advanced GI cancers that the minimally invasive approach could potentially compromise uh, oncological outcomes. In terms of the evidence for laparoscopic cytoreductive surgery hypac, um, the, uh, the the first uh, case series was published by an American group back in 2011, and um, over the last decade, decade, particularly in Europe and in Spain, um, there's been a lot of enthusiasm, um, especially in a group in Cordoba in Spain, um, about performing laparoscopic cytorotative surgery and hypet for uh, even for more invasive malignancies uh, with ovarian and colorectal peritoneal metastases, as well as performing for benign multicystic mesothelioma. Um, there, uh, there's a, a single case report from Saudi Arabia um, describing um, safety and feasibility of performing. Uh, single incision uh, laparoscopic surgery for saturated surgery in HIPAC. And there are uh, a case report uh, for PMP in a small case series for ovarian peritoneal metastases where um, the Da Vinci XI is used for a robotic assisted um, cytorotative surgery in HIPAC. In terms of um, better quality evidence uh, published last year is the um, Peritoneal Surface Oncology Group International or SOGI. Um, and their International Registry of Laparoscopic Cytorotative Surgery and HIPAC. Um, and this has allowed for cumulative experience and assessment of what is a specialised um, treatment 
uh, performing specialist uh, centres for uh, rare tumour types. And it's extremely difficult um, to get any quality data from single centre retrospective cohort studies. So this, um, uh, this study was uh, uh, contributed to, from uh, 10 high volume specialist centres, so they, they could perform a minimum of 50 saturative surgery high prep procedures a year. Uh, overall, there was 200 patients registered. Um, in terms of the analysis of the data, uh, 57 patients were excluded who've had uh, what we call risk-reducing laparoscopic uh, saturative surgery in HIPEC. So they're, that, they're patients with a PCI score of zero. Um, and so in total, 143 patients were, uh, were included in the analysis. And you can see this is a different selected patient group. A younger patient, mean age of 53, uh, eldest patient was 61. Um, they have a normal BMI um, with a BMI of, uh, of a median BMI of 25. Highest BMI uh, performed was, was 28, um, and uh, which is very unusual for uh, um, if you're operating in the in the UK. I, I can tell you, but 90% um, of the surgery, 90% of the patients um, had only, had only minimal surgery previously. So that may be a laparoscopy or biopsy, appendicectomy, or a single quadrant resection. Um, and um, around 75% um, uh, of, of patients in this group had more less invasive and more indolent pathologies. So the PMP, multicystic benign mesothelioma uh, pathologies, uh, whereas 25% uh, of patients um, uh, had underlying diagnosis of more invasive malignancies. Um, and 90% of patients the surgery was performed for primary disease. So ten percent of procedures were done for recurrent disease. And this is the main take-home message for the invasive approach: is that um, in this group of patients that had a, a very low uh, single-figure PCI uh, of, of three. So the, the range of three maximum PCI in this this group of patients was five. And th these are the t t patients to, to target potentially with the million invasive approach. Um, around about a third of patients did, however, have a, uh, um, a resection, either small bile, colorectal, or splenectomy. And in total, um, uh, overall, 100% uh, of patients got a complete cytoreduction reduction, with 97% a, a CC zero. And, and in this group of patients, the actual the time of surgery was was all things all things considered was pretty good with uh, mean mean time of surgery three hundred minutes with minimum blood loss as expected um, and as expected the length of day in these patients was short um, uh, median length of stay six days um, compares uh, uh, much better to, to the uh, the open group of patients with um, low morbidity and low mortality. So how does laparoscopic surgery, surgery and HIPEC compare to um, the open approach? Well, uh, colleagues at the Christie um, uh, published um, uh, a study where we compared uh, laparoscopic uh, risk-reducing cytoreactive surgery and HIPEC with um, uh, versus open uh, for, um, uh, perf this is for low-grade um, penicillin mucin ne neoplasms that are perforated. So the, the two groups uh, were well matched. Main difference was um, certainly um, operative time was was uh, significantly longer than the laparoscopic group, uh, roughly a, a an average uh, an hour and a half longer. Um, the PCI score uh, there was no difference between the groups and no difference between blood transfusion rates. Um, what uh, a significant difference, however, was uh, with uh, length of stay, um, both. Um, uh, in terms of critical care admission, where almost 100% of patients in the open group go to critical care unit postoperatively, whereas 50% uh, of the uh, laparoscopic group did, and um, the the median length of stay was uh, again was six in the laparoscopic group, and uh, compared to 10 in the um, the open group, and there was no difference between uh, morbidity and mortality. So I'll move on now to a a video case, and this is a, a case of a. Uh, uh, where we've performed a laparoscopic risk-reducing cytotrope surgery in HIPEC in a 66-year-old male who uh, previously had undergone a laparoscopic appendicectomy for uh, an incidental uh, mucosal appendix. On histology, it was found to be perforated with um, acellular mucin on the serosal surface of the appendix, or LAM2. 
and uh, um, the uh, post-operative post-appendicectomy CT scan 12 weeks later showed only a minimal trace of fluid in the right eye fossa. So uh, this was uh, um, essentially a, a normal CT scan. Uh, the, the patients were referred to our specialist centre, had a specialist pathology review to confirm the diagnosis, a review in our parotidal tumour service MDT, where we offer the patient either surveillance with six monthly, um, a six-month CT scan with, uh, with scans uh, then to annually then 18 months up, up to eight years, and then all, all the option of a laparoscopic risk reducing surgery, which the patient um, decides to go forward with. So, hopefully, this video will, will, will work. Um, so, in terms of how to perform laparoscopic side surgery, in terms of port placements and pneumoperitoneum, that's created in a standard fashion by insert five ports uh, in the horizontal plane just above the umbilicus, usually. Um, and after the side reductive surgery is completed, um, the specimen the specimen is extracted. I use a 12 mil trocast to insert four ports for to deliver the hypec in the um, into the um, uh, four ports onto the right hand side to deliver the um, the hypec. Um, so the start of the the, the procedure requires a, a very careful um, uh, laparoscopic assessment, thorough assessment of laparoscopic cavity. And you can see here there's a, uh, a I've just paused the video. You can see there's a, unexpectedly we found. A, uh, a several uh, mucinous deposits over the right liver surface, despite there being a normal CT scan. Up in the left upper quadrant, that was fine. There was no evidence of any disease there. And you can see down in the pelvis, there's some mucinous, but also a thin film of mucin in the pelvic, uh, covering the pelvic peritoneum. So um, onto the right of the fossa, and we divide the adhesions in order to assess the appendix stump for any potential residual disease, and also to open up the planes here to expose the hypec agent to this area. And um, this patient had an R0 appendicectomy, so there was no need to do a, a completion sequel pole excision. Um, and as part of the thorough assessment, it requires a full walk run through of the small bowel, look at, examining, you see the DJ Fletcher was examined then right the way down to the TI, looking at the serosal and meson, uh, mesenteric surfaces. And back down to the pelvis, this technique, we're using a tonsil swab in Johan to um, rub uh, and wipe all the uh, mucin from the peritoneal surface. So this case doesn't need a peritonectomy. It's just surface disease, it's easily removable as, as uh, same techniques used here in the uh, right upper quadrant of the diaphragmatic um, surface. But looking further, um, there's concern here that uh, there was further mucin around um, the back of the, uh, the right lobe of the liver. You can see there's some disease on the liver surface there as well. So uh, the additional five mil uh, port was inserted. And uh, uh, that enabled uh, using a hook diaphragm to divide these adhesions around uh, the, the right lobe of the liver posteriorly in order to access that area, ensure that all the residual disease is being removed. And then using the diaphragm to ablate the, the liver surface disease. So moving on to the cholecystectomy, and the main learning point um, different technique here is the use of hemolox rather than uh, liger clips. Uh, there's less chance of them being dislodged during the um, during the hypec. Uh, and now the uh, falciform ligaments and the ligament enteres are excised here using the good tension with the left hand and using the hook to uh, zip down the, the liver surface to um, to reset the um, falciform ligament here.
So moving on to the uh, greater omentectomy, and here you need a good assistant that you need to make good use of uh, to display the greater omentum uh, nicely as a sheet, and then uh, begun the careful dissection, combination of, uh, of sharp and, and blunt dissection uh, to carefully dissect the greater momentum off uh, the mesocolon, obviously taking especially good care and attention to avoid damage to the uh, middle colon vessels. Using a Thunderbeat device here. You can see now the lesser sac is opened, um, the posterior surface of the stomach and uh, pancreas are displayed. And we continue dissection then up towards the left upper quadrant and the, the spleen. And actually, as you'll see, coming around splenic Fletcher, uh, the, I think you get better views here through the laparoscope than you, than you do at open surgery. Um, and you usually stop there on left or quadrant and turn my attention back towards the greater curve of the stomach to uh, divide the gastroepiploic um, vessels and arcade here. And then dividing the main gastroepiploic uh, trunk with the Thunderbeat device um, around about the level of pyrolorus or um, D1. So again, um, there's, there's back up to the left of the quadrant, there's one remaining tongue of momentum up towards the spleen. As this is risk reducing surgery, uh, we're going to preserve the spleen um, and then decide a level to transact safely to avoid any iatrogenic splenic injury um, and divide the, the final part of the momentum here, just, just inferior to the uh, splenic hilum. So the final part of the uh, dissection um, is a uh, vagal nerve sparing lesser omentectomy. The specimens are all then placed in a, a burp bag uh, and extracted by, by extending the umbilical port site incision and then performing a, uh, an umbilectomy as we do a standard. Um, uh, the the uh, the ports are then converted at 12 month trocar to to insert the four uh, hypet perfusion um, drains um, and then we begin the hypet with the close technique uh, and here using uh, mitomycin C with three pulses over 90 minutes. So in terms of this is my final slide. So um, overall, I, I recommend laparoscopic sites for to surgery and hypet. Um, in the, um, but for highly selected patients with low grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms with a, a normal uh, post operative post appendicectomy CT scan that does not demonstrate any um, extensive peritoneal disease because that's PMP and that requires an open size uh, reduction in IPAC. So for patients with low PCIs and the risk reducing procedures, um, for uh, invasive peritoneal surface malignancies, there's a word of caution. There may be a role for minimum invasive surge, surgery here, but cytorrhythmic surgery high for highly selected patients with uh, uh, low PCI uh, potentially. But um, given the current limitations with cross-sectional imaging and with laparoscopic imaging, um, certainly the standard of care for uh, invasive malignancies, the adenocarcinomas, gastric, ovarian, colorectal, 
uh, goblet cell cancer of the appendix, as well as mesi malignant mesothelioma, uh, an open approach is still recommended. So thank you for listening. Um, and does anyone have any questions? Okay, sir. Uh, Professor Bai, uh, it's been a, a lot of clarity and the videos which show was uh, very clearly emulating the steps of the procedure. Um, like, uh, I would like to ask one quick question. Um, like, sure. uh, you very categorically uh, said how to choose the patients for the surgery. Um, there have been some studies which mention we can do a staged peritoneal uh, surgeries. Say, for instance, you remove, uh, say, a certain amount of 60%, 70%, and then go for a second procedure after a few weeks. Do you, do, do you still have, or do you believe this uh, stage procedure, or you always believe it should happen in one go? No, de definitely. So we... We're not talking about a laparoscopic or minimally invasive approach for these type of patients. Uh, this is for, uh, you're talking about open uh, cytosurgery surgeon, HIPEC, uh, as a staged approach. And definitely that's, that's a, uh, uh, for, for, for certain patients, that's the right way forward. Um, I think um, uh, def definitely so. And uh, um, the, uh, in terms of the, the benefits are often, for, often that's used for high volume PMP. Um, so in a patient where, um, there, there may be, because of the PMP process, they're cachexic, uh, malnourished, um, and um, they need to get out of trouble. So um, putting them through a, um, a one operation with a, a, a complete cytoreductive surgery, hyper, you know, 14 hours of operating, multiple visceral resection, a patient that um, uh, won't be able to tolerate that. So they're the type of patients that benefit from uh, a, a staged approach with an upfront, uh, lapar we call them debulking laparotomies, so um, a, a diagnostic debulking laparotomy. So the advantage of that is that you drain all the mucin, um, you remove the, say, the, the primary appendix tumor, uh, ovaries in women, um, and um, and the um, a, a limited or infracolic greater amentectomy, and not doing too much um, in order to disturb tissue planes for, for another term, and often I would clear the pelvis, the lower abdomen, first of all. Um, the advantage then is you get the patient out of trouble, they recover for the next three to six months. It, it, it lends itself if this is low-grade disease, obviously very different if it's invasive disease because you don't have that time frame to wait. So, so for the low-grade disease patients, then that, that is it. And then you can go back six months later to clear the, clear the upper abdomen. Um, and, and a stage approach works very well. But you can't do a stage approach laparoscopically because... The reason for the stage approach is the high volume disease, and that's a contraindication to, to minimally invasive approach. Uh, one question is whether to give high packet both, both, both operations. Um, there may be a benefit of that. Thank you very much. And uh, as minimally invasive surgeons, we always worried about the safety of peritoneal access. With uh, you dealing with so much difficult peritoneal disease, how often do you have challenges in access and whatever strategies for a safe access? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, this it's about selecting the right, often it's about selecting the right patients based on their, you know, reviewing their previous surgery. You know, if you, if you, it's good to look back, review the operation note, you know, often our cases are referred from other centers. So, you need to get all the information you need. Uh, if the patient had an asthmatic leak or intraoral collection, that obviously um, uh, would make you more concerned about the risk of adhesions. Um, again, the number of previous surgeries, were there adhesions noted at the previous operation? Um, and then in terms of, um, uh, and again, examining the patient is, is, is obviously important. You get a feel for the abdomen, the, you know, heavily scarred abdomen um, on the outside. Then I always worry about um, adhesions on the inside as well. So. Um, in terms of then uh, access, um, si similar using, often using, um, uh, I prefer a, um, a cut down at, uh, at Palmer's point and left upper quadrant to get access if I was concerned about if the patient had a, uh, you know, lower midline incision um, and, uh, and you know, carefully counseling the patient to, to inform there's a higher risk of conversion to open.
but Palmer's point is that safer. I, I used to use Vera's needle. I, I, I don't use it as, as much now. I just prefer a, a, a cut down. Thank you very much. And uh, how often you land up with the, say, for instance, you were uh, you mentioned about the anastomotic leak many times. Do we have challenges in missed injuries? Because uh, many times these type of surgeries warrant pushing off the bowels to one side because you need more broader access to the entire peritoneal cavity. I'm sure you reposition the patient during operation so that the bowels does not keep coming on your way because the idea is the completeness of exposure of the peritoneum. Uh, do yeah. we have any uh, special maneuvers of positioning the patient for doing this procedure? Because we get to see many times we change the angles, we change the right-left maneuvers. So what is your department's protocol on that? So again, um, it goes back to careful selection of patients and um, uh, especially in, in a country that's got a, an obesity epidemic, um, I'd only select patients with with normal low, low BMI, um, uh, and um, uh, in, because in the in the patients with with increased intra-abdominal adiposity, it can be impossible, despite you know the best techniques and the the, the best will. Um, uh, you, you can't get the views you require, um, and it goes back to selecting the right patients with low-grade disease rather than invasive disease. Low-grade disease, worst-case scenario, even if you were to miss a pocket of mucin. Then you could easily go back. You know that patient may then develop a, a, a lesion on a scan in eighteen months, two years time, and that can be very still very easily be easily treatable. Whereas if you miss a, a an invasive peritoneal implant, then um, you're in trouble. But 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 going back to te techniques of uh, of yeah, n nothing more apart from you know um, uh, then. <laughs> making sure you've got a happy anesthetist that's willing to put the patient you know, in steep um, head down um, as necessary. Um, but I think it all goes down to the, there's no particular, I don't use any particular special techniques to, to, to ensure the small bowels packed away or out of the way. It's, it really goes down to the patient selection, to be honest. Thank you very much. The other next important issue is uh, a lot of uh, the targeted therapies uh, are coming up with big uh, bang telling they have better metastatic disease control. So how do you look upon those drugs? Uh, are they going to challenge the hyper procedure in the near future or how far the drugs are helping the patients? As it? Yeah, um, so certainly, yeah, and it, it's exciting times um, for, for medical oncologists and, and for, for the patients with metastatic disease. And you see some incredibly... Uh, amazing uh, complete responses or com complete radiological responses to um, to some of the uh, immunotherapies, um, and and I see that it it, it um, as as cytotoxic surgeon Hypec does now, it complements. It's part of multimodal uh, therapy for metastatic um, peritoneal disease. Um, so it's not uh, one or the other, um, but certainly in higher risk patients, um, those that are, you know are uh, MSI high. Um, on the um, tumor biology, um, would um, then you've got I've got better options now, um, but it's the, the two should complement each other, um, and, and maybe um, going forward that uh, actually the, there'll be patients that were pre previously um, unresectable uh, with conventional chemotherapies to downstage disease that that now the, the the new and novel therapies will actually downstage disease enough to be um, uh, to be resectable. And of course, there's the, there's some uh, uh, you know it's, it's mainly lab-based uh, research that's that's looking at potential new novel high pack agents, including immunotherapy um, high pack agents as well. So um, it's de definitely the um, the way forward, and um, uh, I'm, I'm you know, looking forward to see see how this uh, this area of uh, of surgery and on oncology goes. Professor Royal, I think we momentarily lost your connection. Um, uh, can you I can hear you now, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? It's, it's okay this side. It's okay this side. I've just, I've just taken my video off in case you can hear me more clearly. 
Okay, no, uh, we are happy with the way things are uh, looked upon, the right perspective. And uh, I'm sure uh, the good work being done will benefit a lot of patients. Maybe we look forward to have uh, the opportunity to see one of your videos. Uh, are you, uh, have you loaded your uh, technique videos into your YouTube, uh, Professor Poyle? Yeah, certainly we, we need to do that. We need to be better at that. Certainly, um, we can. Uh, uh, there is a there is another uh, that, that my colleague, Mr. Sawaseka, uh, has. Uh, I know he's published a video on uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery, a, a different video or in uh, colorectal disease. Um, so that that's available um, on the colorectal disease um, uh, video library. But yeah, uh, publishing videos of techniques is something that I'm certainly looking to uh, um, to improve on. Thank you very much, Professor Boyle. Uh, President, sir, your comments and uh, we'll call it a close. You're in mute mode, sir. Uh, uh, really, we enjoy the, enjoy to enjoy, we listen and to bands of surgery, uh, tan and uh, Professor Jonathan and uh, he really enjoyed it and uh, it was an ex excellent uh, 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 work and demonstration, uh, Professor Jonathan. And as far as uh, Tan, uh, the uh, lecture is concerned, one has to enjoy the work, uh, what he is doing. When it is affected, uh, you know, uh, naturally the burning starts there. And uh, the teamwork, leadership, and the interpersonal relationship, and uh, the organization, and, uh, the system, he has explained so well. And he has stressed upon the importance of uh, physical well being, mental well being, and uh, emotional well being. Above all, the spiritual well-being in which India is crystallized, and uh, all these things are uh, uh, very important. And uh, AAGS is grateful to 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 these two great personalities. Uh, welcome and uh, uh, a lot of time and spend with us. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, President. Uh, Madam Liana, are you with us? I, I take this opportunity to welcome you all to poem to once again for our National Congress IAGS, February 9, 10, uh, 11. Um, uh, you're all my guests. Thank you. Thank you, President. Madam Liana, are you with us? Hello, yes, I'm still here. Uh, would you like to comment or would you like to give any questions from your side? So obviously this discussion is a is a little bit um, above uh, my, my training grade at the moment. Um, but this is, a, I just wanted to ask about HIPAC. It's just like, what are the common complications um, that us trainees should be aware about, uh, should be aware of and, and manage them then post-operatively on, on the ward? Professor Weil. Hello, uh, Professor Weil. Uh, uh, Liana asked a question yeah. regarding the post operative complications. Uh, I would request, I think uh, we lost uh, Dr. Weil for a moment. Uh, Madam Liana, can you reframe your questions again for the benefit of the professor? Yes, so maybe my connection is a little bit poor. That's why I've switched my, my, my video off. Um, so, as I said, that um, probably the separation is a little bit above my training grade at the moment. Um, but I think as, as a trainee, what we're interested in is how to manage post-operative um, complications and which, which of them are, are the commonest that we might come across on the ward post-operatively. So this is following patients having cytorrhythmic surgery in a high pack. Um, certainly in, in the UK, you're only going to be managing post-operative complications in patients having cytorrhythmic surgery in a high pack if you work in two to three centres. Uh, the Christie in Manchester, Basingstoke in 
uh, um, on the south coast of England, um, and the, the the team in Birmingham also do some. So it's it's a um, it, you're not going to come across the uh, these com- you know post operative patients in your in in practice at and you training elsewhere uh, in the UK because of our uh, centralised specialist service. Uh, what you may come across is um, uh, patients that are op- because we operate on patients from all over the UK that um, patients may be discharged from us and um, uh, and readmitted uh, through accidents and emergency um, in, in the local hospital. So, um, and, of, and often the management is no different than any other surgical patient in terms of the, um, the basics and uh, um, a basic assessment, um, especially assessment for sepsis, which can be an issue. In terms of giving the high, the high pec is very safe. It's got very low um, risk to it. The, the risks come through the from the cytoreactive surgery and the morbidity from the cytoreactive surgery in high pack, um, but we're no different than any other any other colorectal uh, or GI patients with um, and, and how we manage. We, we may we may try and manage anastomotic leaks more conservatively because of the difficulty, you know, potentially hostile abdomen to to go back into if they're beyond ten days from a cytoreactive surgery in high pack. Um, uh, in the immediate post-op period. Often the inflammatory markers are quite elevated anyway. So um, when compared to a standard colorectal procedure where the CRP can be a useful indicator for potential anastomotic leak, we don't we don't we don't bother with um, uh, looking at inflammatory markers in in our, in our patients. We we expect the white cell count to be elevated normally by uh, um, by day five, and obviously we're relying heavily on um, uh, uh, on CT scans to to to. It's, it's about like any any other patient to improve outcomes. It's it's detecting a problem. It's acting on it soon um, uh, to minimise any um, uh, any any risk and, and improve any outcomes if if the patient was to 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 suffer from a complication. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Weil. Um, uh, I hope uh, if there are more not more questions. And I request the honor of inviting uh, Dr. Satish Mitha, National Secretary, to propose the word of thanks, please. Uh, good evening, all. So it was again a nice learning evening for all of us. So on behalf of IAGS uh, Executive Committee, our President, I thank both our learned speakers, Professor Tan Arupalamam and Professor Jonathan Wild. Though these two topics were on a different spectrum, uh, but they were very useful topics, and uh, it was a great learning experience for all of us, and it will generate uh, new ideas, especially among the youngsters. And uh, <clears throat> we know both the topics are important, and uh, burnout is a common problem among physicians and surgeons. And we have to deal with it uh, meticulously so that we can give the best outcome. And Dr. Jonathan, who has a focused area of working, uh, we were impressed by your videos, especially. Uh, it, it was a good video presentation. So thank you again, both of you. Thanks, Professor Celia Selvaskar for being with us this evening. Lina to be a part of this meeting. So thank you all. Thanks our president, Dr. Tangavellu, and the convener of this meeting, Professor Kanagwell, and the whole DocFlexus team uh, for arranging this IAGS prime time. Hope uh, our association will strengthen in coming years and we'll have uh, better meetings in days to come. Thank you once again. Have a good day. Bye. Good night. Thank you, uh, Secretary, sir. Uh, friends, I am to inform the next program of the IHS Prime Time is going to be on the 10th September. We have Professor Roxanne Liu from the Bates of, from California speaking on various aspects of implementation of robotic surgery in uh, various hernia repair. So we look forward to have a unique program and look forward to having you all amidst us. And with that, we come to the close of the session. Uh, Selva, sir, are you with us? I think he's no more with us. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Would you like to say something before we close? Uh, I, I think I, I would like to thank both uh, um, Tan and um, 
Johnny Wild for their excellent presentation and good discussion, and also Liana contributing from the ALSGBI Training Academy. Um, it's a fantastic organization. Thank you, Dr. Kanaguel, for uh, uh, bringing everything together, and uh, Professor LPT and Satish Media for uh, being the president and the secretary uh, of the um, IAGES in coordinating the whole lot. We've got the ALSGBI IAGES webinar next Sunday uh, around the same time. So uh, we will catch up then. And uh, thank you very much. Good night, friends. Um, with the permission of the faculty, can we sign off the uh, meeting? Okay. Thank you, Professor Weil. Okay. Bye. Yes, Good thank night. you very much. Enjoyed Thanks it thoroughly.